And joining us now on the debate in Vancouver, British Columbia, Shauna Sylvester, director of the project Canada's World. In the nation's capital, Fen Osler Hampson, director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. And here in studio, John Curtin, director of the G8 Research Group at the University of Toronto. And it's good to have you, Professor Curtin, here back in our studios and to our two guests on the line. Nice to have you alongside as well tonight. I want to start by just putting up this graphic here and I'll ask our director, Michael Smith, to do that. Just so we all know who the players are. I know you guys know, but not sure everybody in our audience know. Here are the G8. Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, which is the additional country from the G7, the UK and the US. That's in alphabetical order, or as Canadians would say, in order of importance. Now let's do the G20, which are all of the countries we just listed, those eight, plus the European Union, Australia, China, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Argentina, Brazil, India, Mexico, South Africa, and Turkey. And if you add up all of those economies, it's about two-thirds of the world's population, and depending on how you count it, 85 or 90 percent of the world's economic output. Now, major discussions on the global economy that used to happen in the G8, we are now told, are going to be happening in the G20. And John Curtin, why don't you start us off? What does this say now about Canada's influence on the world stage today? Oh, I think it's uh, the next step in Canada's expanding influence on the world stage. Uh, not only does Canada continue to be uh, a player in the continuing G8, but in addition, it's now got a, a firm seat at the table of a new G20 summit, uh, which has just been uh, institutionalized at its most recent gathering in Pittsburgh. So it will go on and on uh, after the current crisis pasts. Uh, and I think the greatest honor, uh, in addition to the um, two summit clubs uh, with Canada in both, is that Canada was chosen to host not only the G8 uh, summit uh, next summer, but the first ever institutionalized G20 summit along with uh, the South Koreans uh, as well. So it's a great step forward. Shauna Sylvester, what do you say on that question? Well, I think some might argue that uh, going from uh, G8 to G20 might dilute Canada's position, but I'm not sure if that's the case. I think it's more important to be a part of a larger group that has significance and relevance more so than being a part of a smaller group that's declining in significance. And I think that's important that the G8, as we heard from Paul Martin, is declining in influence and the G20 is stepping into its place. And Canada as being one of the architects of the G20, certainly the idea coming, as he said from Paul Martin, is an important player and has a great opportunity in Huntsville in June to really put its mark on the G20. Finn Hampson, though, if you just do the basic math, isn't it better to be a group of seven or eight than a part of a group of 20 in terms of clout? There's no question, Steve, that uh, smaller clubs uh, generally tend to uh, work more effectively because you have uh, a smaller number of countries sitting around the table talking to each other. But uh, 20 is not an insurmountable obstacle in terms of uh, membership size. I think the more important issue is really if you have memberships in these organizations and institutions, and the G8, G20 are really institutions, it's an annual conference, annual meeting, or in the case of the 20, it uh, seems to be biannual. The real issue is what do you do with your memberships? Uh, do you, uh, are you active in the institution? Do you help set the agenda? When there are divisions in the institution, do you use that to your advantage to play a kind of brokering role, which traditionally we've played? When you're hosting a summit, uh, do you take vigorous uh, uh, initiatives, put them on the table. That's really the issue for Canada. It's not accumulating memberships, it's what you do with them. Well, let's follow up on that. The world's coming to, to uh, Huntsville, Ontario next June, right? So tell us what whoever the Prime Minister of the day is then, let's say it's Stephen Harper for argument's sake today, uh, what will he be able to do as the head of the gathering that is gathering in Huntsville that if it were happening in some other country he couldn't do? John Curtin. Well, uh, I think Fenn is right uh, to uh, reap the maximum advantage uh, with the, uh, all the prerogatives of host. You really do have to be strategic. Uh, so well over a year ago, uh, Mr. Harper uh, laid out publicly uh, his game plan for his summit and then embellished it uh, this past uh, summer. Uh, so first, uh, on the economic side, it's going to be open markets for trade uh, and investment but now within a uh, climate uh, of economic stability where the key issue is the coordinated exit strategies uh, now that the recovery uh, is presumably uh, on track. The second is climate change. Uh, there's uh, increasing 
uh, judgment uh, that the great UN conference in Copenhagen uh, designed to uh, produce a successor uh, for the uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, which has massively failed, uh, will fail as well. So it will really be up to the G8 next summer to grapple with uh, climate change, and that was part of Mr. Harper's game plan from the beginning. Uh, in addition, of course, um, freedom, democracy, uh, rule of law, things like um, supporting uh, the new democratic revolution from the streets of Tehran that we've seen in the summer, uh, and of course, um, winning uh, the war uh, in Afghanistan and trying to bring um, peace uh, and ideally a democratic peace to the broader Middle East uh, as a whole. That's a job for the G8 uh, and not the G20 yet. So Shauna Sylvester, admittedly we're going to have some kind of home court advantage, if you want to put it that way, next summer in Huntsville. But Canada's a middle power. And depending on what day of the week it is, it's either a more or less influential middle power, depending on what the issue is as well. Do you think that we have an ability to be able to actually lead the world in something next June in Huntsville because of this home court advantage? I think we do, but I think we can't look at the G20 as separate from other processes go that are going on in the world. I think if we go in and say that Copenhagen is going to be a failure, uh, we're not going to make any friends. And I think today there was a report that the Group of 77 walked out on the Canadian position on Kyoto as we spoke uh, on the Kyoto Accord and, and, and our desires to get rid of it and negotiate a new deal. So one of the, the ways in which Canada has demonstrated its capacity to lead in the past has been as a bridge builder, as a consensus builder, as a policy entrepreneur in the international arena. And if we take advantage of that capital that we've built over the years and really use it and develop those relationships that we need in other forms in order to make the G20 successful, then I think, yes, we can have some influence. But we have to have a strategic agenda. I'm not sure to say democracy, human rights, climate change is a strategic agenda. Where does Canada sit on those things? What are we trying to achieve? And how do we hope to do that through the G20? And I think that that's missing from our conversation. Okay, Finn, let me try this with you. This is what uh, Prime Minister Mulroney's former Chief of Staff, Norman Spector, had to say. Uh, last month in the Globe and Mail. He wrote, in future, the G7 will deal with geopolitical issues, according to The Guardian. The G8 will deal with security matters, according to a CNN report. Or, perhaps, as a New York Times reporter speculates, the G8 will, quote, become more like a dinner club that defers to the broader group on the economic issues that have dominated summit meetings for nearly three decades. Okay, let's try and figure all this out here. What role, if any, will the G7, sometimes the G8, if you include Russia, play now that the G20 is rising in status. Can you help us with that one? Sure. The G7 is largely a group of like-minded countries. They share similar democratic political institutions. They are all committed to essentially a liberal, a liberal open market economy. Russia was added to the G8 at the Halifax summit back in the 90s. And um, there continues to be some uh, discomfort, uh, largely because uh, it's, uh, it's not as uh, democratic as we'd like it to be, and its commitment to uh, open markets in all areas is somewhat questionable. Um, when you get to the 20, it's, uh, it's a much more diverse grouping. Uh, you know, we have to bear in mind uh, China, certainly a, a very important major economic power, uh, but it's, uh, to all intents and purposes, still an authoritarian system. And so uh, there's always going to be uh, that, that supper club of, uh, of the like-minded, uh, whether they meet uh, on the edges of a G20 uh, meeting or whether they meet uh, separately. In the case of, uh, in the, case of uh, uh, the relationship between the G8 and the G20, it's quite clear that uh, the meeting that we're going to be hosting, uh, these two uh, conferences uh, are essentially going to be merging. The eight will still meet, uh, perhaps uh, over dinner. Uh, and then uh, uh, the 20 uh, will meet uh, to continue to discuss uh, uh, the lingering uh, financial and, and economic crisis, uh, which we're still dealing with. And there's still a lot of uh, uh, issues uh, coming out of, uh, that came out of uh, Pittsburgh, that came out of the earlier London summit, uh, that uh, uh, both the developed and developing countries are wrestling with. And I think uh, part of the success of the 20 has been that it's had uh, a fairly narrow economic agenda. It hasn't got into issues of uh, climate change, uh, democratic reform, and so forth. And arguably, 
one of the problems with the G8 is that its agenda became far too ambitious, far too bureaucratized. Uh, those meetings were preceded by uh, summits of ministers. Uh, the last uh, summit uh, in, uh, in Italy uh, was preceded by something like nine ministerial meetings. And in, in a sense, uh, the institution lot, lost its effectiveness, not just uh, uh, because of its membership, but because it had become uh, a very uh, formal, uh, bureaucratically driven institution. Okay, let me get John Curtin on that as well. The, the distinction between the roles that G7, G8, and G20 are going to play. Do you agree in, in seeing how it unfolds? Well, to some extent, you really do see a division of labor, uh, and I think Fenn is quite right. Um, the G20's forte, uh, what really brought it to life was combating the global financial crisis, and there it has proven uh, that it really uh, can deliver coordinated financial stimulus uh, of a scale um, with the simultaneity uh, that we really needed to uh, stop the free fall uh, into another uh, great recession. On other issues, the G20 has proven it can get uh, its act together uh, combating tax havens, uh, particularly at a time when uh, all governments, uh, especially uh, in the developed world, need more tax dollars to help finance uh, their fiscal stimulus. But on others, um, trade, uh, the G20 is yet to prove it can deliver, uh, even stopping protectionism amongst its members, let alone getting uh, multilateral uh, trade liberalization negotiations back on track. Or how about regulation in the case of banks? Uh, well, they're moving there. Uh, that will always be really painful uh, because, of course, domestic financial regulation is very much at the core uh, of a country's uh, sovereignty, uh, how you regulate your banks, uh, the command institutions uh, in the Canadian economy, uh, and the others, but we do see a uh, progress uh, moving forward uh, towards new standards on uh, banking capital, uh, banking uh, liquidity. Uh, we're even moving towards a common global accounting regime so everybody will know what the numbers mean uh, and can share and uh, compare. Okay, let me, Shauna Sylvester, read this to you from the Financial Times written by Edward Luce again last month and then get you to comment on the question coming out of it. If you want to find out, he writes, what the world is going to do then take the U.S. position and take China's position and draw a line somewhere in the middle. That's a quote from David Rothkopf, a former official in the Clinton administration. As regards to the G20, he goes on, it would have been more efficient to kick Canada and Italy out of the G8 and invite China and India to replace them. But intergovernmental cooperation always adds, it never subtracts. This is, um, I guess, a bit of a controversial question for Canadian officials. We know Canada is in the G8. But the question, Shauna, is does Canada belong in the G8? What do you say? Well, I think it's a provocative statement. And, and yes, I do believe that Canada belongs in the G8. And while you might try and put a set of indicators together to determine what are the most influential and important 20 countries, Canada may not sit on that uh, list. But there was a time when the U.S. wanted Canada at the table because it wanted a North American ally to counter some of the European influence. But Canada went beyond just being an ally. They demonstrated through the ideas that they brought to the table, to the ability to convene, that it deserved a seat at the table. And I think that we have an opportunity to demonstrate that again. Uh, in terms of what we can do, it really depends on, on how we strate strategically state our position and how we then maneuver to fulfill it. And I think that we have led on financial regulation, and that is an area that in London we did, we did lead in that, with co-chaired that, that committee, and we were able to put forward some ideas. We haven't gone far enough to demonstrate a Canadian approach, but uh, I think we could. And so it was compelling listening to former Prime Minister Paul Martin talk. He had such energy and vision for what he thought could be achieved by the G20. And I think that's what we need to hear, is we need to hear a real vision for what we want to achieve and to demonstrate again that we belong at the table. Steve, well, could I come in on that? Please do. Uh, the, the issue of Canadian membership and should we be a member of uh, the G8, uh, I'd like to uh, point out uh, to your viewers that um, uh, going into the, this uh, recent crisis, uh, Canada had the, uh, the highest growth rates of any of the OECD countries. Uh, we were uh, the leader of the pack. Uh, we have an economy that is more than twice the size uh, that of Russia. Uh, Italy is, uh, continues to be a, a major underperformer uh, and uh, is experiencing very serious economic problems. Uh, if you look at uh, the 20, 
there are a lot of countries there uh, that have economies uh, that are much smaller than that of Canada. Uh, Turkey, uh, Argentina, uh, our good friends, uh, the Australians, uh, who are also members of uh, the 20. What about the so, G8, though? So, uh, no, but, but, but in the context of the G8, and if you look at uh, where the Canadian economy is going, now we're, we're coming slowly out of the recession, but we're very much a commodity-driven economy. Commodity prices are uh, shooting up uh, and will continue to, uh, uh, to rise uh, with uh, the growth of, uh, of China. And uh, that's uh, good news for, uh, for Canada's uh, economic future. So uh, we, we continue to be uh, one of the most powerful and dynamic economies uh, in the international system, as Shauna pointed out. We're also seen as uh, the poster child for how we've uh, managed uh, our own banking system. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, we uh, uh, did not uh, get into uh, some of the difficulties, uh, many of the difficulties uh, that some of our major trading partners, uh, particularly the United States, got into. So uh, co other countries are already looking to Canada uh, to play uh, a leadership role. Okay, since, since obviously none of you is going to play devil's advocate, I'm going to have to play it tonight. John Curtin, we don't have anything close to one of the top eight economies in the world, which is supposed to be what that club was all about. Um, yes, we have a, a long history of having been a, you know, stable democracy in this very crazy world. But come on, if it, if it was measured on economies, we don't we don't belong anywhere close to this place, right? Well, you're a good Canadian, uh, trying to be modest, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a wise thing to do, uh, so people don't uh, ask us to bear more of the burden uh, in places like, say, Afghanistan, uh, where uh, we're number three or number four. But no. Uh, we probably got uh, the ninth or tenth largest economy in the world, so we're close. Depends a bit on exchange rates, but boy, ours is shooting up uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we've got the uh, largest uh, uranium uh, production uh, in the world, so whether you're worried about nuclear proliferation, key issue, uh, think of Iran and North Korea, or climate change control through clean, safe, carbon-free uh, nuclear uh, power, uh, we rank, uh, in fact, uh, number one in the world, if you're worried about food security, uh, the biggest supplier in the world of uh, potash. Okay, but uh, these are all metrics that are supposedly not what are brought to bear when you figure out who belongs in the G7, right? It's supposed to be size of the economy. We don't cut the top seven. Uh, well, we're about uh, the top uh, nine or ten now, and if you look at the forecasts, uh, the IMF, where you're going. the OECD, um, mm -hmm. we're projected to have mm -hmm. the fastest growing economy in the uh, G8 uh, in 2010. Uh, and we've got uh, the most rapidly growing population uh, in the uh, G8 uh, to back it up. So okay, it gets worse. I got a quote here. Hang on, because I'm really going to play devil's advocate with you here. <laughs> Here's, you all know these two, Gordon Smith and Barry Cairn, writing in March of 09, if objective criteria were used to select the 20 most important countries in the world, Canada, they write, would probably not make the cut. For They're example, wrong. hang on, i got to finish the quote and then you get to tear my head off. For example, it just scrapes in today on a list of 20 countries having at least 2% of global GDP or population, but it certainly will not in 2020. Okay, Shauna, you first, then Fen Hampson. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I disagree too much with Gordon Smith, but I don't think it's just the issue of the size of the economy. It's what you do in that club. I mean, clubs are, are, are clubs. They, they have all sorts of criteria that may or may not be implemented. They're political bodies for the most part. And I think Canada had earned its place at the table. And I think that because the idea of the G20 really came to, in some extent from Canada, we were a great advocate of it, I think that we have an opportunity to demonstrate our importance at that table. But we can't, it can't just be a membership that is driving us. We need to be re really clear on our vision and our objectives for what we're trying to do at the G20. Uh, I think this is the issue. Does it matter? What is it that we're using these clubs for? I think that's the key question. It's a question that Fen Hampson, Hampson raised at the beginning. Okay, well then, Fen, I want you to address not only that, because we've already heard tonight from Shauna that this country has yet to kind of flex, it, flex its muscles in terms of presenting a Canadian vision for what it wants to do when it leads the world at various times. And you just heard Smith and Karen say, we're not even in the top 20 of important countries in the world, never mind size of economies, of important countries. What do you say to that? Well, uh, I'm not sure what metrics they're using. Uh, if you look at, uh, as I said earlier, uh, economic growth rates, uh, the, si the current size of our economy, um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> our commitment to open markets, the fact that we're one of the world's great trading states, 
Um, we, uh, we certainly have uh, uh, a presence uh, in these institutions. We needn't question why we're there. Uh, the real question is, what is our interest? And our interest is in a stable, uh, open, uh, small L liberal uh, <coughs> trading uh, uh, system. Uh, we are one of the most globalized economies uh, in the world. And uh, we have a real interest in ensuring that uh, uh, international institutions work, uh, that, uh, <coughs> and it's not just the financial institutions, it's, uh, it's the international trading uh, regime, the World, trading Orga uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, so we have very legitimate, what I would call, uh, world order interests. And uh, I think, uh, to be fair to, uh, to Mr. Harper, uh, he has been uh, uh, pursuing uh, that agenda. Uh, quietly uh, in uh, the meetings of uh, both the G8 uh, and, uh, and the G20. Uh, I have heard uh, directly from uh, some of the Sherpas, uh, from uh, some of the other uh, major countries that uh, Canada uh, continues to be seen as, uh, as an effective player, uh, that our leadership uh, is playing an effective role. Uh, we don't always see it because uh, uh, what happens uh, uh, around the summit table is not a matter for public discussion. And, uh, and so uh, it's often the theatrics that's taking place uh, around the fringes of these meetings that uh, tends to capture uh, the media's interest. Okay, let's try this on for size. I want to take the first part of that quote, which John Curtin suggested that if you really want to find out what to do in the world, take the American position, the Chinese position, draw a line somewhere in the middle is where you find what's going to happen. Uh, is that Clinton administration official, Rothkopf, right, that when you really get down to it, never mind G20, never mind G8, G7, it's a G2 world. It's the U.S. and China. Uh, well, it's not. Of course, you can find the odd commentator who pops up with that uh, bright idea uh, now and then. Uh, but uh, no G2 has come into existence, uh, even in the crisis. Uh, and there's no sign that it will. Now, it is true uh, that the United States has a bilateral uh, dialogue uh, with China and good on them. Uh, but if the two of them want to run off and to solve the global climate change problem, they are the number one and two uh, carbon producing powers, but they only represent 40%. If they want to solve 100% of the global problem by solving it all by themselves in a private deal, uh, well, good on them. The rest of the world will applaud. We don't have to do anything, but they don't, they can't, uh, they won't. Uh, and take some of the other uh, issues. Um, the United States is quite concerned uh, with winning or not losing the war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, can they do a deal with the Chinese uh, to solve that problem? Uh, no, uh, they can't. And then when you get into uh, banking regulation, accounting, credit rating uh, agencies, the uh, Chinese are still running an essentially closed financial system, uh, so they don't even understand uh, what the United States' problem is. The Europeans do, the Canadians do, uh, yes, the Brazilians do, uh, and they're getting it uh, right. Uh, so the United States does need help from other consequential powers but it's by no means China alone, you, not you it's others. They, do you think they see that today, that they need others' help? Oh, very much. Uh, look, George Bush had a choice when he was faced uh, with a free fall in the U.S. economy at the heart of his financial system, which everyone thought was their ultimate uh, resource. Uh, he could have uh, rounded up a few of his uh, friends, uh, as Sarkozy uh, thought uh, he should. He could have uh, rung up a uh, huge intel. He didn't. Uh, he said, look, I've only got 24 days to pull this together. And he said the G20 has worked at the finance minister's level. I need the G20. It's the club that's proven it can work. It's my only choice. And that's why we got the first G20 summit, and now the second and the third right. uh, and many more. Shauna Sylvester, let me try this with you. I know you have been expressing a kind of a, uh, or putting a clarion call, if you like, out there for some kind of more tangible sign of Canadian leadership in these international fora and what are our values and what do we stand for and all of that. But we were extremely influential in getting this G20 thing off the ground to begin with. Is that not a pretty good sign that Canada, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a driver's seat in this thing? I'm not sure if we're in a driver's seat. I think, and the question is not really about prestige and importance either. I think the question is effectiveness. Are we effective in uh, convening? Are we able to use those opportunities to advance not just our values, but our interests and our assets? Are we leveraging our assets in the international arena to greater effect? 
And, and that's what I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing, and, and perhaps Fenn is right that this is happening behind closed doors. But I've, I've looked at most of the announcements of uh, uh, the current government, and I'm not seeing a vision. I'm not seeing what it is that we're trying to achieve. And this goes much broader than, than just the G20. I don't think you can separate out things like climate change and from economic discussions. These are becoming much more enmeshed into the economic discussions of developing countries. I think that if we alienate ourselves in climate change discussions from the rest of uh, the G77 or the group of 77 at the very least and others, then we're in, we're in a difficult situation to really play that bridging role that we have been good at at something like the G20. So we've really got to, I think, figure out which communities we belong to, what our commitment is to them, and live up to the commitments. And I think that's how we demonstrate our leadership. Then do you see something that apparently Shauna does not? Well, the, 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 the focus of uh, uh, certainly the uh, discussions in the G20 has been a pretty narrow agenda around uh, uh, regulatory issues, um, uh, uh, beating back uh, uh, the uh, growing tide of uh, protectionism, um, uh, uh, <coughs> trying to uh, uh, bring about reform of uh, uh, both uh, uh, the International Monetary Fund and the Bretton Woods, uh, the uh, World Bank, uh, both, both of which are uh, part of the Bretton Woods system. Uh, and, uh, and there we're seeing uh, incremental progress. Uh, Canada has been uh, a strong supporter of uh, reform of those institutions uh, in terms of uh, voting shares. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, many of these issues uh, are quite technical. It's very much uh, a subject of conversation uh, around finance ministers, uh, central bankers. Uh, the degree, quite frankly, of financial literacy uh, among the world's leaders is uh, uneven. Uh, Stephen Harper uh, is actually one of the most literate uh, when it comes to these issues. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, these are problems that are not going to be solved uh, in one meeting uh, with one communique, and, uh, and, and progress is going to be incremental. And therefore, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to see what, uh, what the end game is, uh, what uh, the overall strategy is. John Curtin wants to follow. Uh, I think we see lots of uh, Canadian leadership. For example, just when the Pittsburgh G20 summit opened, Canada unilaterally uh, said uh, to the uh, poor countries in Africa, here is $2.6 billion uh, to help you uh, develop and uh, pull out of the uh, recession uh, that we're in. Uh, they didn't send the money uh, through Washington to the IMF or the World Bank, dominated by Americans. They sent it straight to the African Development Bank, run and dominated by uh, Africans. Uh, so on the development uh, assistance front, uh, that is a major unilateral uh, act of leadership. Fenn mentioned open trade, um, where uh, virtually all of the G20 uh, countries are uh, sinning. Uh, but Canada is, uh, over the past few years, uh, a leader in actual trade liberalization. We've concluded already bilateral, full free trade deals with six countries. That's uh, more than any other in Canadian history before. Uh, we're negotiating for a full trade agreement uh, with the European Union, a bigger economic space than the United States, uh, Pierre Trudeau tried, uh, but failed to do that. And twice in the past year, uh, in the January 27th budget, and then just a few weeks ago, Canada unilaterally lowered its tariffs, engaged in unilateral trade liberalization. Uh, and in the G20, uh, everybody um, knows that. Uh, so when uh, Mr. Harper preaches, about the need to uh, prevent protectionism, to move towards open trade. Uh, he's put uh, his own actions and leadership uh, where his mouth is, uh, and Canada uh, very much uh, is in the lead on that issue uh, in the G20 and elsewhere. Shauna, let me let you come back I was going to ask briefly. to come back in on that. Um, yeah. So one of the questions I would ask both John and Finn, you know, we have led on financial regulation, but why is it that there is not greater recognition of a Canadian approach? as an example. Why aren't we hearing people refer to Canada in, in, in greater numbers and in greater, in greater consequence? We didn't hear that. We, we hear, if you follow the international news, and I know you did after both London and Pittsburgh, the focus not, was not at all on Can Canadian solutions. It was maybe perhaps for our Canadian media, but it Shana, wasn't you, in the international. You put the question. How would you answer it? I'm not sure that, that we have uh, maybe because, actually, let me try and answer the question. I think we're doing it behind closed doors. I don't think that that we are um, 
proactive enough in terms of putting forward our vision. I think we tend to be a little bit more reactive and quiet, uh, feeling our ways uh, way around. I don't think that, that we have had the kind of leadership that we've seen in the past or the boldness that we've seen in the past. We're a little bit more tentative. So that's how it feels, at least from my perspective. I mean, I am on the West Coast. Maybe, maybe <laughs> our, the news we get here is a little different. But, but that's, that's the sense that we have, is that it's not, we're not out there. Okay. We're not out in front. We're down I do, sorry, let sorry, me just jump ahead. in here, because we're down to five minutes left, and I want to put one more thing on the table here. And that is, you know, it's good to be in the club. And we're in a lot of clubs here. And I have a, you know, I have a list of just some of them here. We're in the G7, the G8, the G20, NATO, APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, group, the Commonwealth, La Francophonie, uh, Organization of American States, the OAS, and there's more. Membership has its privileges, but um, FEN, it's also got its responsibilities, and I want to know whether or not we actually have the resources and the capability to meet all of the responsibilities that being in all of those clubs entails. Well, I guess the, uh, the real question is, uh, how do we stack up to, uh, to other countries that we would compare ourselves against? And the fact is, uh, in terms of our international memberships, we're pretty much in the middle of the pack. If you look at uh, European countries, uh, they uh, typically uh, are bigger uh, club members. A lot of that comes through uh, membership in the various institutions of uh, the European Union. But uh, I think you do have a point. I mean, there, there are uh, some institutions, uh, I would uh, refer to them as legacy institutions, like uh, the Commonwealth, uh, La Francophonie, uh, which, um, uh, are not uh, exactly uh, hotbeds of uh, uh, social, uh, political, or economic uh, activism. So would you leave them? Uh, the, the, well, the reason we're there is because... Uh, because we're there. Uh, uh, because, uh, no, uh, the reason we're there is largely for historical uh, reasons. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, is made up of uh, former uh, countries of uh, the British Empire. Okay, let me get... Uh, in let the me past, get... it has played uh, an important role on some issues, like uh, helping to end apartheid, and we played a key role there. But uh, we're, not, we're not doing very much with those institutions, and it may be time to, to have a look at why we're there. Let me get John Curtin on that. Would you recommend us dropping out of some of those institutions if we're no longer you know, really playing a meaningful role in them? Not at all. Uh, we invented, we Canada, la francophonie, um, at the uh, summit level. And the ones you describe all uh, meet regularly uh, at the leader's level. And if you look at the ones, uh, your list is a good one, uh, the institutions of global relevance, Canada is the most well-connected member of those clubs, the most well-connected country uh, in the world. We do both the francophonie uh, and uh, the commonwealth. The Brits and the French don't. We do um, APEC. The Europeans don't. Uh, and that gives us an extraordinary ability to be in touch with all the powers and clubs that count uh, in the world, uh, but also to work our agenda uh, at one meeting and then uh, a few months later uh, at another summit in a consistent fashion. Can we bear the burden? Uh, on bad days, uh, it seems uh, pretty tough uh, when uh, we hear the news of casualties uh, in Afghanistan. But on the whole, uh, the IMF projections show that Look ahead five years, Canada will have by far the lowest debt burden as a percentage of GDP in the G8. So the money will be there uh, relative uh, to the others. And with that rapidly growing population, that openness to the world uh, through immigration, our multicultural model, I think the answer is uh, yes, we are and yes, we can. Oh, somebody already took yes, we can. You've got to come up with something yeah. else on that. Shauna, what do you say on whether or not uh, we need to reevaluate which forums we are in? Well, I'm not sure if the question is reevaluating the forums. It's what are we doing within them. Uh, my husband once said to me, when you look at a meeting, there are people that go because they're happy to invite, be invited. There's, there are people that, are, that go because they have to go. And there's people that go because they have an agenda. So which advance. category are we in? I hope we're in the last. I hope that that's where we are. I don't think that we're clear on that. Now, one of the things I just want to point out, there are people like Brian Mulroney who used some of those memberships so effectively. He really used those various alliances to advance agendas, whether it was the agenda on South Africa, as Fenn has pointed out, or, in, or in, on the environment. And I think we need to look at having invested so much in those multilateral fora, how do we use them to advance strategic agendas? And how do we also um, live up to the commitments that, that those memberships confer? And, and I think that's, that's more of the important question that we should be asking. Well, follow up on that, Sean, in our last minute here. Um, do we not ask that question enough at senior levels in this country? 
I'm not seeing it being asked. I have to say, I'd have to go back to the years of Mulroney to really see some clear uh, foreign policy agendas being pursued. I, I think we've been uh, different, different priorities over different years, really, since 92, and I'm looking for some real vision going forward. But I think, I think, I think one of the challenges is that, you know, we've seen a succession of minority governments that have had a, a life uh, cycle of about two years. It's very hard to, it's tough uh, to do under be, those be, be, be charting new courses in foreign policy when you've got to keep your yeah. ministers home for the next vote in the House. Let me save <laughs> 10 seconds here for John Curtin in Toronto. Go ahead. I think the big difference between Prime Minister Mulroney and Prime Minister Harper uh, was in uh, the loquaciousness. Uh, Mr. Mulroney was very good uh, with his Irish uh, tongue about telling everyone, including the media, of all the great things Canada did. Uh, Mr. Harper uh, is not loquacious to nearly the same degree. That doesn't mean that behind the scenes there isn't a strategy uh, that's paying off. Well, I think governance includes talking to your citizens, and I wish that he would speak more openly about what he is doing. You talking he about is, Prime Minister is, Harper now? I am. Okay. He is singing to us now. So, uh... <laughs> Just like Mr. Mulroney, he is singing now. That is <laughs> that's true. Right. Okay, that's our time for this evening. Can I thank our guest, Shauna Sylvester from Simon Fraser University on the left coast, Fen Hampson from Carleton University in the nation's capital, John Curtin from the G8 Research Group at the U of T. Great to have all of you along for tonight's discussion. Thanks so much. Now, for more information about tonight's guests and a report co-edited by John Curtin on last month's G20 Summit in Pittsburgh, please visit us online at tvo.org slash the agenda. Tonight's program was produced by Mark Brosens and Daniel Kitts. And you can read Daniel's interview with Oxford University economics professor Domenico Lombardi on how Italy is reacting to the shift from the G8 to the G20. You'll find that on our Inside Agenda Producers blog, also at our website, tvo.org slash the agenda.